Kazakhstan is a country located in the heart of Eurasia, appeared on the geopolitical map only in 1991. It is bounded on the northwest and north by Russia, on the east by China, and on the south by Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, the Aral Sea and Turkmenistan. The Caspian Sea bounds Kazakhstan to the southwest. Kazakhstan is the largest country in Central Asia and the ninth largest in the world. For centuries, the great Kazakh steppe accepted caravans of the Silk Road in oases of its cities and settlements. It was historically closely tied to the Silk Road trade routes, acting as a crossroads for the movement of people, goods and ideas between Europe and Asia. The capital of Kazakhstan and its the largest business center is Nur Sultan. The third megapolis of the country, Shymkent, is as a city in the south of Kazakhstan with an 800 years history founded in the 12th century. Nowadays, Shymkent is a city of national significance, one of the largest industrial, commercial and cultural centers of the country, the third largest by population of more than one million people. One of the large multidisciplinary education institutions of Kazakhstan with a deep history is located here. It is ours of University. That is, here students and undergraduates acquire practical working skills. In other words, this is a mini copy of a large production and diary plant. Within the framework of the program of scholarship academic mobility and double degree education, the university cooperates with more than 170 foreign universities. 150 students a year study for the academic mobility at leading universities in the world. The digitalization process has affected all spheres of society, including education. At ours of University, innovations are intensively introduced into the education system and 3D, VR, STEM technologies are widely used. The IT Center provides consulting to teachers of schools in Shimkan on robotics, provides material resources to students in the laboratory of robotics and mechatronics at the laboratory of mathematical and 3D modeling and provides material resources of the IT Center to students and teachers of the hours of university. In Student Design Bureau, students and teachers prepare scientific projects for participation in regional, national and international competitions. Students of clubs and Student Design Bureau develop robotic systems for participation in competitions and competitions in robotics. The material and technical base of the university consists of 10 educational buildings of a modern standard, 6 student dormitories and 2 sports complexes. For the comprehensive development of students, more than 30 public, political and cultural organizations function. A of University that has united history and modernity today prepares more than 27,000 students and invites to take your best.
Hello, everybody. Good evening, everyone. So, welcome to our uh, week of novel lectures. And so, today we're going on on Wednesday, and our next lecture is uh, from our laureate of, uh, laureate of uh, Briggs Prize in the Fundamental of Physics. Uh, today, we'll have a lecture from Professor Juan Malvin Senna. Uh, before we start, I would like to introduce uh, me. Uh, so I would like to present my personality to Professor Martin Senna. So, Professor, I am Rojan Ainadek from Alwazif University from Kazakhstan. <clears throat> at the moment, I am at the Department uh, of uh, Chemical Technology of Argan Sakhmetis and also in the Science Department of the University. So, I need the Science Administration. So, before we start with your lecture, I'd like to yeah, ask a question. And before I ask my question, I'd like to uh, let you uh, talk how uh, how far and how we know you. So we know you, of course, uh, as not only as a uh, laureate of uh, breakthrough prize in fundamental physics. Yes, so we know you as a theoretical physicist as the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. If I if I if I'm correct, uh, in New Jersey. And uh, and also, of course, uh, but we know, of course, uh, the, uh, about your big contributions to the study of uh, quantum gravity and superstring theory. And uh, we know that it's actually this great work was the base for getting also the Breakthrough Prize in 2012. So, Professor Mandelsena, so, <clears throat> Now, if I may to turn to the question, so maybe as a start of your lecture, so it is as following. So, uh, so despite active research, the story of quantum gravity has not yet been built. The main difficulty, as we know, as it's known in its construction, lies in the fact that the two physical theories that in tries to tie together. They are quantum mechanics and general relativity rely on different sets of principles. So what do you see could be the solution to this problem? And I think actually it is about your lecture actually and the answer will occur also during your lecture, within your lecture. So Professor, so, you are on turn, please take your turn, take your work. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be there. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay, well, I will uh, share my screen. Um, let's see, can you see the screen? Can... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. It's a very good topic. So I will I will talk uh, during this this presentation about uh, quantum gravity, and my talk will be basically on the things we really understand about quantum gravity. And I will leave till the end the things the more modern things and the things we don't quite understand. But before we uh, start talking about quantum gravity, we have to talk about classical gravity, and in particular. Uh, we start with Newtonian gravity. So that's the theory of gravity that Newton uh, discovered. And this theory is based on uh, two equations or two relations. One uh, is the relation that gives the force uh, between two massive particles. So it's a force that depends on the masses of the particles. It's proportional to the masses, the product of the masses of the particle and the square of the, uh, the inverse square of the distance. Um, and there is a constant uh, called the Newton constant, which uh, sets the strength of the interaction. Um, and then there is another equation which tells us that if we have a given force, then it tells us what the acceleration is. So it's force equal to mass times acceleration. Um, and based on these two, for two equations, we can calculate the motion of uh, various bodies and of course, we know that this uh, works very well for objects, for apples that fall uh, on Earth, and for the moon that uh, moves around the Earth, and so on. Um, now, 
Newtonian gravity has two interesting features. Uh, one is that the acceleration on a particle, on, on one of these particles, is uh, independent of the mass of the particle. So here in this equation, you can cancel the, um, the mass, and you get that the acceleration is equal to something which is independent of the mass. And this is saying that all objects fall in the same way in a gravitational field. Um, so if you have a, a feather and a, and a rock and you throw them in a gravitational field and you remove the air, then both will fall exactly in the same way. So that's one of the features. The second feature is that the force is completely instantaneous. So it uh, depends on the position at a particular time and, um, and so on, and not on the position that it had at previous times. Now, Einstein uh, had an interesting idea that was based on the first observation here. Um, and he called this uh, his happiest thought. Um, so his idea was that if you fall freely in a gravitational field, uh, your weight completely disappears, or basically the main effect of gravity disappears. So for example, if you are uh, standing in an elevator, uh, you could be standing on a, on a scale that is uh, giving your weight. And if the rope uh, breaks and you start falling, then um, you will be falling and then the weight that the scale measures would completely disappear. You would feel as if you are floating inside this elevator. Um, and uh, of course, uh, if we have an astronaut that is uh, orbiting the Earth, uh, they, they feel exactly in the same way. So both there is a force acting both on the spaceship and on the astronaut but uh, the, the force is moving both objects in exactly the same way. And so the astronaut feels as if uh, he or she is uh, weightless. Um, now, in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a new idea. So the idea of special relativity. And this idea was uh, based first on relativity, which is the idea that two observers traveling with constant relative velocity should observe the same laws of physics. Um, and uh, that was the first principle. And this principle goes back all the way to Galileo. Um, and the second one is that no signal can propagate faster than the speed of light. And this is really the new idea. Uh, and this, this speed of light is constant for all observers, so that all observers see uh, the same speed of light. And this implies time uh, passes in different ways for observers who are moving at relative velocities. Um, so that was uh, a new idea. Um, and this was based on uh, thinking about the loss of electricity and magnetism. Um, and then Einstein combined uh, this his happy thought with this uh, principle of special relativity to construct the theory of general relativity. So uh, this theory is Einstein's theory of gravity. So it's a modification of Newton's theory. And uh, in this theory, the idea is that space-time is not flat, but is curved and deformed. So the idea is that uh, space-time space is deformed due to the presence of the Earth. Um, this uh, deforms the fabric of the space-time geometry. It also causes time to flow at different rates in different positions. And then uh, if, you, if you have a, a, a particle that is moving, um, then the particle chooses to move along the line that has the shortest uh, the shortest trajectory essentially in this curved space time and the fact that all particles move in the same way is due to the fact that they are all exploring the same space time so they are all feeling the same space time geometry and they're all choosing the shortest uh, trajectory in that space time so it, it incorporates that principle that says that the motion of this particle should be independent of its mass. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that's, um, that's the principle of, those are the ideas that go into the construction of this theory of general relativity. And um, this uh, theory makes a, a few predictions. So the, there are three that are surprising. So, there is uh, gravity waves and black holes and the expansion of the universe. And they were so surprising that Einstein himself uh, doubted uh, all these three predictions. Um, in particular, uh, when he was presented with the idea of the expansion of the universe, Einstein uh, told Lemaitre, who had produced, proposed this idea, 
your mathematics is excellent, but your physics is this much. Um, so this, this I think, uh, shows that uh, even Einstein, who was uh, really, really very smart uh, in creating this theory, very intelligent, he was even uh, at a loss or surprised about the dr drastic predictions of this new theory. Um, so gravity waves were seen uh, very clearly first in uh, 2016 through the detection of gravity waves produced uh, due to the collision of black holes. Uh, and since then, uh, many events like this have been discovered and uh, the predictions that we get from general relativity for these gravitational waves are uh, consistent with, uh, with the observation. Um, the other is uh, black holes. And so there is a lot of evidence for the existence of black holes. And this picture here is a picture that was taken by uh, a certain uh, radio telescope called the Event Horizon Telescope. And this is the image of a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy that, um, so it's somewhat far away. And so this is not directly the black hole itself. The black hole is some, something small here and um, of more or less this size. And this is gas that is moving around the black hole and its light is being deflected in a particular uh, pattern like this uh, annulus pattern. And we think that this is evidence for the existence of a black hole. And this, this telescope is continue to, will continue to do more and more and more observations and so we'll have more and more evidence of that, that there is a black hole there. But this is just one uh, particular black hole for which uh, we can show, this is the closest of a picture of a black hole that, that we know so far. Uh, um, so black holes are thought to arise natural through the evolution of stars. Um, for stars that are a few times more massive than the sun, so the sun will not evolve into a black hole, but uh, if, if for stars that are more massive, they could evolve into black holes. And there are also very, very supermassive black holes at the centers of big, ga big galaxies. And those black holes have masses of order a million or a billion suns. So for example, uh, this picture we just saw um, corresponds to a black hole that has a mass of order a billion uh, or a thousand million. Um, so, and then another uh, surprising prediction of general relativity, as we said, was the expansion of the universe. And so the idea is that at long distances, so distances larger than the typical separation between galaxies, uh, the, universe, the universe looks uh, fairly uniform. And this is sometimes called the Copernican principle that uh, after Copernicus, who said that we don't occupy a special place in the universe, that uh, all points in space are more or less the same. Um, and we could also uh, solve the equations of general relativity with a uniform uh, density of matter. And when you do that, you find that um, the space times are either generically, they will either expand or collapse. And so we just happen to be living in an expanding universe. Um, and it's, it is expanding from a state that was much simpler in the past than it is today. And we'll, we'll mention this point a few times, uh, but that's one of the very interesting aspects about our picture for uh, the evolution of the universe, that we're evolving from something that was very simple in the past into something that is now more complicated. Um, so what is this surprising simplicity of the early universe? Um, so the idea is that at the fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the universe looks like a almost uniform gas of radiation plus a few elementary particles such as protons, electrons, and dark matter. Um, so we don't have the complex uh, chemical elements we have today. We just have uh, some uh, more or less uniform gas of these particles. And um, this later, uh, as they evolve and cool down, uh, so this top was very, very hot. And then as it, the universe expands, this uh, cools down and this particles produce the first few chemical elements in the periodic table. And the rest of the chemical elements that we have here on Earth were produced uh, later in stars that then later exploded. Um, so the, the complex chemistry we have now was produced uh, through the evolution of the universe, but was not present in the very beginning. Um, so in fact, we can have a picture of how the universe looked when it was uh, 300,000 years old. Um, 
And this is a picture of the so-called cosmic microwave background. So it's a picture of the radiation coming from this very hot universe. As the universe uh, cooled, at some point, the universe becomes cools down enough that um, the protons and electrons combine into neutral atoms, and then radiation can travel uh, can travel freely without being absorbed or scattered. Um, and so we see uh, this radiation that's been traveling for more or less almost the age of the universe. Um, and it's very uniform in all directions. Um, and there are, but there are small in homogeneities, but these inhomogeneities, which are the difference here between the blue region and the red region, this, this difference reflects a tiny difference in the temperature of this uh, radiation that is coming out from all directions. So this map here is a map of the a sphere around us um, that's been flattened and put on the screen. Um, and the differences between the blue and red regions is very, very, very tiny. So it's mu much smaller than the uh, average temperature. So the density fluctuations here have been greatly exaggerated. In reality, uh, it's one part in 100,000. So that's uh, the tiny variation we have from, from the blue region to the red region here in this picture. Uh, and these tiny uh, differences have recently been measured. So the picture is that uh, we have some initial uh, Big Bang explosion or some event here. Maybe there was uh, a period that we'll later discuss of inflation. Um, and then the universe starts very hot and then it uh, cools down and the cosmic microwave background radiation is emitted and the universe was uh, cold and well what was a little colder than before but was neutral and very uniform and then the first stars form and the universe continues expanding and uh, more and more stars form and galaxies form and so on uh, and we are today after 13.7 uh, billion years uh, since this earlier stage um, now, all of this is the classical picture of the universe um, and based on general relativity. But another principle that was discovered in the beginning of the 20th century was the idea of quantum mechanics, that uh, the laws of physics were not uh, what Newton said there was, there were, but there was uh, another modification uh, which um, involves uh, a new type of physical description uh, of what's going on at short distances. And this description is intrinsically probabilistic in the sense that many times we cannot say exactly what will happen, but we can only give the probability that something will, ha will happen. Um, and another prediction of this theory, uh, I'm just telling you what the predictions are. I'm not explaining why they are this way, but another prediction is that the energies of some systems are quantized. So the, the energy cannot be arbitrary, uh, but uh, should come in certain packets, uh, certain um, in certain elementary units. And so when you have, for example, uh, some oscillating system, so classically, you, for example, a pendulum, classically you can have uh, any energy because it could be oscillating with any amplitude. However, in quantum mechanics, uh, the energies, the possible energies are uh, coming units of its frequency of oscillations times uh, some very tiny little constant uh, called Planck's constant. And this is a new constant of nature, which has some units uh, of energy times time, because this frequency has units of one over time. So this is units of energy. Uh, and it's a very tiny little constant. So for macroscopic ordinary uh, systems, this is very, very tiny. But when we look at um, this effect is very tiny. But when we look at atoms, which themselves are very small and have very low energies, um, this effect becomes important. So um, and in another feature is that we have these so-called uncertainty relations that tell us that we cannot measure some things uh, very precisely. For example, the position and the momentum or velocity of the particle cannot be measured uh, at the same time and cannot be known at the same time. So if you measure the position very precisely, then the momentum would be very imprecise and so on. Similarly, we cannot measure energies or times uh, very precisely. Um, now, one can join together the idea of special relativity with quantum mechanics, and this leads to, um, to the theory we use to describe elementary particles. And in particular, one of the features of this theory 
is that uh, the light is also a bit like an oscillating system and it's also quantized and the elementary quanta of lights are what we call photon. Um, now, gravity um, is also one of the forces of nature, similar to electromagnetism, but gravity has one feature, which is that it is much, much weaker than the electric forces. Um, and um, for that reason, some of the quantum effects are very, very small for gravity. In the case of gravity, we also have uh, classical waves. So we saw those gravitational waves and the minimal unit of energy. Uh, so if a wave carries the minimal unit, we call that the new particle, which is a graviton. These gravitons have not been directly detected. In fact, uh, we have never detected individual gravitons. So for example, the waves that the gravity waves detectors have, uh, have measured, they have a huge, very, very large number of gravitons. So they don't, these effects don't come from uh, one graviton, but many of them. Um, so, but nevertheless, one can uh, do an approximate uh, quantization. So some approximate way of describing the quantum version of gravity. And so the idea is that we have uh, a background space time. So we have some space time that we treat uh, classically um, as in Einstein's theory. And then quantum effects are described by particles propagating on this space time. So quantum particles, and we can, we, we know how to do that. And over the last uh, uh, 70 to 50 years, uh, we, we've learned a lot about how to describe quantum particles. And there are even the simplest approximation leads to very interesting effects when the space time is curved. And I will explain some of them. And the most interesting effect has to do with the creation of particles in time dependent backgrounds. So we'll see how when we have an expanding universe, we can uh, create particles due to this effect. But before I explain that, let's start with a simpler system, uh, the system of a quantum pendulum. So imagine you have just an ordinary pendulum, a mass uh, hanging from a, a string. Um, and so as we said, this, uh, th this, um, so this system uh, in the quantum theory, in its lowest energy state, will be described by some probability distribution for the angle. Um, for the position, so it won't be exactly at the, the won't be exactly vertical. It might there will be some distribution from the for the angle. Um, as we change, for example, the length of the spring, uh, then uh, the distribution for the angle will change because the oscillation frequency remember changes and the quantum of energy is now different, and so we'll have a distribution for probability distribution from the angle, which will be a little wider. Of course, for, for an ordinary pendulum, this, uh, this, this distribution in angles is very, very narrow, uh, but, um, but still non-trivial. Non um, so, but the point I want to explain here is that uh, the probability distribution for the angle depends on the length of the pendulum. Um, now, imagine that now we uh, change the length of the pendulum. So we start with some pendulum that was in its lowest energy state and we slowly, very, very slowly change the length of the pendulum. Then this pendulum will remain in, in its lowest energy state, but the angle will, uh, will spread and we'll have now this new distribution. On the other hand, if we change the length very, very rapidly, uh, suddenly, then if we change it suddenly, then the distribution from the angle is the same, uh, but <clears throat> the minimal energy state had a different distribution. And therefore, this state with the original distribution will, from the point of view of the new pendulum, will be a state uh, that contains more energy or will have more quanta of energy. So it will be, um, it, it, it's an excited state. It's not uh, the minimal energy state. Um, so uh, now we could consider a field like the electromagnetic field, for example, and you can view it as a collection of oscillators, similar to having different pendula. So each uh, frequency of uh, the gravitational waves can be viewed as one of these pendulums. Um, and they're all in the vacuum, they're all in their minimum energy state. So that's uh, how we picture the vacuum. And if one of them is excited to its first uh, quantum level of energy, then uh, it's oscillating slightly. And there we say that we have a single photon of a particular frequency. Now let's imagine, go back to the idea of the expanding universe. So we have, um, when the universe expands, if you are some observer who's sitting uh, just quietly there, 
and you have a friend that's sitting quietly some, somewhere else, the distance between you and your friend will start uh, increasing. So that's what it means for the universe to expand. Now, if you have some wave, uh, let's say an electromagnetic wave, which has some wavelength, um, as the universe expands, this uh, wave will stretch, it will change. Um, and this stretching will uh, change its frequency. So it's somewhat similar to changing the length of the pendulum, similar to the example we discussed before. Um, and if uh, the expansion rate is, uh, is proportional to the frequency of this wave, then uh, this expansion is relatively rapid and can leave uh, this field, not in its ground state, but can lead to some excitations. And these excitations are viewed as particles. So we are creating particles by the expansion of the universe. Now, our universe is expanding now, but it's expanding very, very slowly. Uh, so we are not really creating particles of ordinary matter. Um, we, we can create, in principle, very low frequency electromagnetic and gravity waves, but these are not really observable for us. But the universe was expanding more rapidly in the past, and uh, in the past uh, we could have uh, created some particles. And in fact, uh, the theory of cosmic inflation is based on the hypothesis that the universe expanded very rapidly in, rapidly in the past with a rate that was almost constant in time, so it was expanding very, very fast. Um, so the, the classical theory of inflation with uh, no quantum effects um, would say that if you had any perturbation initially present, it would be stretched by a very, very, very huge amount, larger than the size of our universe. And so this classical theory would just produce a uniform universe. And this explains the fact that the universe is fairly uniform at large scales, so scales larger than the distances between galaxies, um, let's say larger than 10 million light years. Um, and so uh, uh, this is a picture of uh, various galaxies that covers, uh, let's say, 120, so all, all, well, a, a big portion of the sky. And we say that the first approximation is uh, fairly uniform. Uh, there, is some, there are some regions where there, is, there are some voids and some regions where they have a little more galaxies. So at shorter scales, it's not quite uniform, but at long scales, it's uniform. So it, it explains uh, why the universe. So, but now we have another question, which is, to explain why the universe is not uniform at shorter distance scales. And the idea is that that can be explained by including inflation theory plus uh, quantum mechanics. And so the idea is that any perturbation that is, was initially present is stretched by a large amount, but quantum effects during inflation uh, amplify small quantum fluctuations and create, uh, create these particles. And these particles are like small um, deviations from uniformity. So it creates a universe which is fairly uniform, but not exactly uniform. And um, in fact, the, the properties of the fluctuations that we see in this picture are in, uh, in fair good, fairly good agreement, which what we would expect from uh, this theory of inflation, from the idea that they were created by some quantum mechanical effects. So this is um, this. This idea that uh, quantum mechanics was important in connection with gravity and in the early universe is important for explaining uh, this feature that we observe in the universe. Um, now, due to gravity, regions that had more density will self-attract and concentrate that matter. And this produces much higher concentrations of matter forming galaxies, stars, and eventually planets. And the position of galaxies, well, one interesting consequence is that the position of galaxies are ultim ultimately detected de determined by quantum fluctuations. So there is an amazing connection between the very small and the very large. So the fact that there is a galaxy here and not, uh, let's say, here, uh, is due to the fact that there was some quantum fluctuation in the very, very, very early universe that led to an overdensity of matter in this region. Um, so it's something that happened at microscopic distances when the universe was very small, and that's something got expanded to very large scales. So it's a. Uh, um, now we also this theory also predicts uh, gravity waves, or some, sometimes they are called tensor fluctuations. But uh, if they are seen, there would be a fairly direct evidence for quantum gravity. But they haven't been seen yet. So people are are looking for these gravity waves that could have been produced by inflation. Um, now I like to. Uh, say a few things about black holes and quantum mechanics. Um, so there is a similar effect which uh, says that black holes emit thermal radiation. 
So, um, well, I guess I'm running out of time, so I don't, I won't explain the whole details of how this works, but the idea is that when you have a black hole, the region near the horizon is in some sense stretching. And the same effect we saw before for cosmology creates particles and uh, implies that black holes uh, have a temperature. Now, for black holes that are made by astrophysical processes, uh, this effect is very small and cannot be observed, but this temperature becomes smaller for, becomes higher for smaller black holes. But smaller black holes, unfortunately, are harder to produce. Uh, but perhaps they were produced at the beginning of the Big Bang. Uh, now, this theory of quantum gravity that I discussed is just the simplest theory, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's not completely mathematically consistent. And so people have been looking for a more mathematically consistent theory of quantum gravity that could explain more things. And we have one interesting candidate, which is called string theory. And there are many interesting aspects of string theory that will live for us some other time. But for now, I'm only going to say that it's a theory under construction. And there are some, some questions we can answer, but there are also many questions we cannot answer. For example, um, we uh, do not know how to describe the black hole singularity or the singularity at the beginning of the universe. And singularity means that uh, with the previous approach, we get some infinity, some, something that doesn't make sense. And the, the, the goal of uh, the theory of quantum gravity is to finally try to understand uh, the explanation of what exactly happened at the beginning of the universe. Um, okay, so in conclusions, um, gravity is due to the geometry of space-time, and we do not yet know the precise version, quantum version of this theory. Uh, so string theory is uh, an interesting quant candidate, but even an approximate quantization leads to very interesting results. One is that uh, black holes emit thermal radiation, and the other one is that uh, an expanding inflationary universe creates density fluctuations that are necessary for the formation of galaxies. And string theory is an interesting candidate for a full theory of quantum gravity. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you, uh, Professor Juan So uh, now I see uh, we may uh, go back to the first, my question, which was the, at the, yeah. the, before your lecture, and so, uh, nevertheless, of course, uh, we have actually the who more than who who, who uh, uh, answer to this question. But nevertheless, could you please describe, or even not describe, maybe to to the clarity what is the, actually the difficulty uh, that to try to get the quantum mechanics and general relativity? Where is the different? Uh, Yes, yes. Well, yeah, so there, 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 are, there, are, two, there are two difficulties. So first, uh, there is an experimental difficulty. So the, the fact that gravity is a very weak force uh, implies that quantum gravity effects are very small for laboratory scales. Um, so, but uh, there are some features of gravity that imply that the quantum gravity effects should become larger and larger as we go to shorter and shorter distances. So, um, I mean, we, we saw that quantum mechanical effects are more important perhaps for atoms than for macroscopic objects. Similarly, um, quantum mechanic, quantum gravity effects are smaller at very, very, very short distances. Distances much, much smaller than an atom. Um, now, these distances are so small that we cannot uh, act, we cannot see them with any um, with any microscope, with the most powerful microscopes that we have, which are the particle accelerators. Um, so, uh, so that's the experimental difficulty. Um, now, the, we, we hope that uh, through the cosmic uh, evolution, so we, we have, on the other hand, some feature that the universe gives us for free, which is um, the universe itself is a bit like a particle collider or a, a microscope because it's um, amplifying something that was very small in the very beginning is making it very large now. So in that way, we can access these very short distances by thinking about this cosmological effects. So these effects that happen at very uh, large distances in the cosmos, they might have had an origin at microscopic scales in the very early universe. So that's the hope that we have for some experimental verification. And this hope is not, uh, well, we, we, we saw already one effect, which was the creation of primordial fluctuations that has to do with quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, and we hope that there are others. 
So, and then there is a theoretical difficulty, which is um, that uh, the standard theories that we use to describe um, particle physics or relativistic quantum mechanics uh, always assume that you have a fixed background, a fixed, uh, fixed metric, a fixed space on which the particles are propagating. But in gravity, that space itself is dynamical. So we, the, the, and time flows at different rates depending on, uh, on what the geometry of space time is. So space and time themselves become uh, quantum mechanical and uncertain uh, like, uh, due to these uncertainty relations. And um, so this uh, creates some complexity in how to describe uh, these quantum mechanical space times. And we, we think we can describe those in some special circumstances, like universes, for example, that are not expanding some special uh, special universes. They are, they're not exactly like ours, but they're somewhat similar. So we have these toy models where we think we can describe uh, what's going on. Uh, I, I didn't describe that in detail during the talk because I thought that these more general points that I've made are uh, a, a prerequisite for understanding these more detailed points. Uh, and uh, so we, we understood better how to describe certain static universes or black holes as seen from the outside. Uh, but we still don't know how to describe situations where space-time is evolving very rapidly, like uh, collapsing in the interior of black holes or in the very beginning of the universe. So. I'm not sure if I may or not, but I think nevertheless I may ask a, a question like this one, which is coming and coming out for me to professional understand. So, do you conduct your research uh, with the I mean, with your university labs, with the university, or do you use some? And so, uh, it's yes, just yes. to know. So, for me, for example, uh, how strong the labs at your university are uh, that you can do uh, research like you do. So, right, right, yeah. So this this area of research, so this researching quantum gravity is purely theoretical because, uh, as I said, it's very difficult to do the experiments in this area. So it's just pure theory. Now in physics, there are some areas. I'm making this uh, whole, the measure, nevertheless, you use some uh, things to measure, to take uh, some, so. Uh, right, right, right. Well, we used, uh, we used observations that people make. So for example, this cosmic microwave background observations that were uh, done with satellites and are available to, to everyone to see. Um, and so we use some features of those, uh, of those observations. But uh, most of the research that we do day to day is, um, is theoretical, it's very mathematical. So uh, now not, not all areas of physics are like this, of course, that it's just our area of physics that is like this. Okay. Uh... Even it's mathematical, but uh, there, there are sort of a big side, which is so, uh, so uh, physics and again, yeah, so uh, quantum uh, mechanical concepts. I'd like to ask my question will be a little bit about related to this uh, topic. So, if we supplement the general theory of relativity with quantum mechanical concepts, so black holes case to be absolutely black, of course. Yeah. In fact, they, as you said also in your lecture, the emit thermal radiation. Right. The existence of the thermal radiation leads to a number of paradoxes. Yes, yes. We additionally, use string theory as a quantum theory of gravity. Some of the paradoxes are resolved. So, what changes does this lead to in our conceptual understanding of space time? Right, right. Well, um so the the recent so in string theory when you when you have a black hole and you look at the black hole from the outside you can think of the black hole as a somewhat ordinary quantum system in the sense that it obeys the laws of quantum mechanics and um, and so you in principle you can describe this Hawking radiation and and if, if you make uh, this assumption there are some apparent paradoxes, and that's these information paradoxes that we were discussing. Um, and through some work in string theory, these paradoxes are being resolved, uh, sort of one by one. And we now understand better how to 
how this uh, space-time geometry emerges from the quantum system. So one of the features of this relationship is that the quantum system that describes the black hole um, does not live in, in the space-time itself. It it's lives in a bit more like abstract space. And then the actual space-time geometry that you have is uh, some collective emergent property uh, that wasn't present in the very beginning. Let me make an analogy. So if you have uh, a bunch of uh, water molecules moving inside a container, right? Um, they, they can separate into liquid and gas, for example. And this surface between liquid and gas is something that emerges out of the interactions of these water molecules. And, and it, uh, it, it, it is not present in the water molecules themselves. Uh, so you, um, and, but the, surf, the surface is of course very real. So an insect can start walking on the surface and so on. Um, and something similar happens with space-time geometry itself. So you start with some elementary quantity, ele some quantum variables, which uh, do not have space and time in, them, in themselves, but out of their correlations and entanglement and so on, uh, you get the, the space-time geometry. And uh, we, we think that's, yeah, and we are understanding more and more of the rules of how this is happening. So as I said, the, these theories that we have are not a complete theory, they are a theory under construction. Thank you, uh, Professor Mando, uh, And uh, why I'm asking also about your labs, uh, before we started with your lecture, there was a uh, uh, really like presentation or clips uh, about our university. It was our university at the end of our city shooting. And I know uh, that you are not first time in this uh, novel fest because I have uh, heard, I have seen your lecture for the from last novel classes, and I think you 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 are here. Uh, our university's name also not for first time, as we are one of the first universities who supported and who so associated uh, with uh, novel class in many uh, events of this uh, festival. And so uh, we are of course at the multi multi profile university open to uh, any kinds of academic and scientific collaborations. And also we are, and uh, as, you, as you have seen from the presentation, we have so many directions uh, at our university. So uh, from chemical technology up to agriculture, also pedagogical or uh, philosophy and biology. And of course, the, one of the big faculties or nowadays already high schools of our university is Natural Science High School, where we have, of course, physics yeah, uh, as the main subject of our. And also we have, uh, among the technical, uh, so we say, we, we used to call them technical faculties. These are, so, for example, a chemical technology faculty or food science faculty, uh, mechanical faculties, and uh, IT faculties. So for these faculties, we have uh, another separate department of physics like the physics for technical technological uh, subjects and so tab tab so tab the group are these faculties so, if, so uh, if I talk only about the physics subject or physics uh, situation at our university and of course the uh, main uh, subjects main direction of science or research works uh, it, uh, it lies in technology and first of all in chemical technology organic or uh, inorganic uh, food science, as I said, uh, metallurgy and then the agriculture complex and construction materials and so on. Uh, and we have also many labs, of course, because it's possible without them to improve to research, yes, uh, to make research works. Um, we are also one of the big universities on students uh, number. Uh, so we have uh, many already so many uh, collaboration, for example, some uh, joint projects with Michigan State University, with Arizona, we have also a starting project, uh, and with Pennsylvania, 
it will be one of the oldest universities, not oldest, I mean, one of the oldest collaborations with US universities, and also uh, in Texas, in Dallas, so with the Southern Methodist University. So actually, we have so had some experience in collaboration with US universities already. Mm -hmm. And so we are, as I said, we are very open to any kind of academic and scientific uh, collaborations. And so what is your opinion? So can um, we, or yeah, is it possible to find some joint points for research or for academic uh, matters between our universities? Well, I'm, I, I suddenly research is a, it's an international enterprise and there are people doing research at the various universities. Um, in fact, uh, the person sitting next door to me is a young postdoc who is from Kazakhstan. So uh, he, his name is uh, Baur, um, Baurshan Muhammadsanov. Maybe I'm not pronouncing his name properly. So that's an example of some collaboration. Uh, not at the level of institutions, but just at the level of people. So. Yes, of course, actually, uh, each collaboration starts from the personal collaborations, I think, yes. So uh, yeah, it's, it goes, it rises up to the institutional level from the personal level, to, uh, from the some uh, So it, it starts between some, uh, maybe student and professor, uh, between professor and professor, and then it uh, develops uh, up to university or institutional level, yes. So, Professor Mulder said that then, uh, on behalf of all the participants and on behalf of all the uh, audience who are uh, listening uh, to your you, who are, who are attending your lecture now, I would like to express my deep praise or my uh, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, and I also would like to wish you big and far achievements in this uh, unbelievable, interesting science like physics. And, and of course, the luck in each start, in each beginnings of your new jobs, in your business, in your researches. Yeah, and hope it's not the last lectures for us and it's all. Even not, not on the lecture, as I said, uh, hopefully we'll meet and see each other, not only using this uh, mm -hmm. festival, maybe there will be another also good uh, possibilities and events uh, to be joined. Okay, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to be there uh, virtually, and uh, best wishes uh, with you and the whole university. In making science progress.